In this video, I'm going to list 10 muscles that are influential in sprinting and rank them in order of importance. As we get further into the list, I'll separate individual muscles rather than selecting entire muscle groups, but for number 10, the muscle group we've selected is the back muscles. Consisting primarily of the lats, traps and rhomboids, the back muscles serve as an important stabiliser while an athlete is running at top speed, and as the arms are pumping, the back muscles keep your torso steady and allow for the power generated from each side to remain balanced. If you were to ask me what benefit large traps and lats could have for improving your speed, I'd instinctively say none, but in order to maintain a balance in musculature throughout your body, building strength in these muscles shouldn't be neglected, particularly if you have a tendency to arch your back when running. When Usain Bolt was young, he had a tendency to run with his head tilted back and an arch in his back, quite possibly due to an exaggerated lumbar curve from lordosis of the lower spine. He also had scoliosis, which he managed well throughout his career, but he had made the point that focusing on training his back has helped to prevent against injury, and having a strong core in general allows his knees to come up to the necessary level during races. The back and abs also work in tandem to keep your torso stable when running. At number 9 we have the deltoids, otherwise known as the shoulder muscles. When an athlete swings their arms, they're recruiting large effort from their shoulder muscles to keep their arms pumping forward and back at a speed that's synchronised with how exceptionally fast their legs are moving. It's very common for 100 and 200 meter sprinters to have well developed shoulder muscles that are visually enhanced due to how lean they are, causing a separation of the insertion between the arm and the shoulder. When it comes to finding out the reason for the correlation with elite sprinters and developed shoulder muscles, you can examine how the shoulder is being stimulated through constant repetition during sprint training. You can also make the case that athletes with body structures with large delt insertions are more likely to excel in sprinting, and you can also assume that sprinters are developing their delts with weight training, either directly or indirectly. Some direct exercises for building the shoulders include isolation such as lateral raises for the side delt, cable pulls for the front delt and reverse flies for the rear delt. Since these exercises typically cause the most hypertrophy by using relatively low weight for 10 or more reps, I think it's unlikely that most sprinters are going to be incorporating these into their training. A more likely exercise that they would use is the standing barbell overhead press and possibly the seated barbell overhead press or seated dumbbell shoulder press. If an athlete is more focused on lifts with greater bar speed, they may get their shoulder stimulation indirectly from power cleans or even finish it off with a jerk to get the bar over their head and activate the delt more. Another possibility is that there's athletes out there who develop their shoulders through the act of sprinting, causing hypertrophy from rapid muscle movements over a span of years. One example we can look to of a sprinter who didn't use weights in the early part of their career was Kim Collins and his shoulders still had an impressive level of development. You can put this down to genetics but I think it's quite likely that athletes with a tendency towards having prominent shoulders when at low body fat will have bodies that are suited to sprinting. The reason I say this is because sprinters tend to have long limbs and long arms usually mean a large delt insertion with the potential for large delt development because of the sheer amount of surface area where mass can be added. When I think of thin sprinters without much muscle mass, one of the first athletes who comes to mind is Steven Gardner, but when you look at his shoulders, you can see that they actually have a massive amount of surface area due to the muscle insertion, meaning that with some training, he could easily have the strong developed shoulders you tend to associate with 100 meter sprinters. At number eight, we have abs. Abs are a massive indicator of how lean someone is, and sprinters are generally some of the leanest athletes you'll find, since sprinting is high intensity exercise, meaning it can burn a lot of calories by comparison to low intensity running. During each sprint, an athlete is going to be raising their legs up to 50 times over 100 meters while performing this leg raise as quickly as possible. Since leg raises are some of the best exercises for activating your ab muscles, raising your legs up to 50 times in a short time frame albeit through different circumstances, is still going to stimulate your abs a lot. As I mentioned already, Bolt said that having a strong core allowed his knees to come up to the necessary level, since ab activation and the knee lift is interconnected. Another motion during sprinting that causes the abs to contract is the arm swing. When the elbow swings backwards during the arm swing, 
It acts similarly to a crunch movement in which your elbows are elevated in terms of ab activation. Simply developing your abs isn't going to be enough on its own to keep your torso stable when sprinting, but if you look to the athletes who have great torso control, there's no doubt they have all built strength in their abdominals. At number 7 we have the calf muscles. Known as the most stubborn muscle to grow, particularly when you have the high calf insertions that are generally associated with the tapered bone structures that sprinters commonly have. The role that the calf muscles play in sprinting shouldn't be understated. A study which I'll link in the description has shown that the size of the calf muscles has little variation between elite sprinters and sub-elite sprinters, with the sub-elite sprinters having season's best times between 10.5 and 11.1, and the elite sprinters having season's best times between 10.03 and 10.17. One conclusion that can be taken from this is that the recruitment of calf muscles while sprinting will develop a base level of calf volume for those who sprint regularly, but developing your calf muscles beyond that point isn't correlated with faster sprint times the same way that some other muscles on this list are. One thing that stands out to me about sprinters' calves more so than their volume is the level of striations and definition they have. Something we should note, however, is that sprinters' muscles tend to look a lot more impressive when they're being activated mid-race which can cause still shots from races to give the impression that sprinters are more jacked than they really are 99% of the time. Working in conjunction with the calf muscles is the Achilles tendon which plays a crucial role in the elastic effort of returning force that's applied to the ground. But since we're focusing solely on muscles for this video, we won't go into detail about the role that tendons play and just focus on the role of muscles which is to contract with precise timing to produce the force needed to gain and maintain speed. At number 6 we have the hamstrings. The hamstrings are a group of three muscles which extend the hip and flex the knee and they play an important part in the leg cycle being mostly active during the late swing phase and the start of the stance phase. The study I referenced already in this video found that the muscles of the hamstring were generally bigger in elite versus sub elite sprinters however not to the extent of other muscles which we'll highlight further into this video. These findings were also consistent with other studies relating to hamstrings, so they're no doubt a priority muscle group to train when it comes to improving your speed, but your effectiveness at using the muscles in force application also has to be considered, rather than just expecting direct speed increase as muscle volume increases. Some exercises to target the hamstrings include leg curls, Romanian deadlifts and Bulgarian split squats. Now that we're getting into the top half of the list, I'm going to split up the muscle groups and label the precise muscles for each of the top 5 spots. At number 5 we have the psoas muscle, which is a muscle I personally didn't have any conception of before sprinting, but while you may not be able to see it when you flex in the mirror, its role in sprinting is particularly important because it's a hip flexor muscle. In a Japanese sprinting documentary, a Safapal was taken for an MRI scan and it was shown that his psoas muscle was particularly well developed even by comparison to a 10.02 sprinter such as Japanese Asahara. Asahara ran a season's best of 10.14 in the 2007 season while Powell ran 9.74 so it raises the question of whether improving his sprint time by 0.4 seconds would cause Asahara's psoas muscle to more resemble that of Powell's or if a naturally more developed psoas muscle is helping Powell to run the faster times. Of course there are a multitude of other factors at play, but it is interesting to examine a muscle that can only be measured by an MRI scan, since the development of it will be indirect through sprinting and weight training, as well as the potential for the muscle to grow unintended from certain supplementation. The psoas muscle connects from the lumbar vertebrae to the top of the femur, and it's most active during the top portion of the hip flexion range of motion, when the hip is flexed to 90 degrees. This may explain why Powell had a particularly developed psoas muscle, since his hip flexion was often coming close to the angle of 90 degrees since he ran with a high knee lift. It's an interesting conversation on whether an athlete's range of motion throughout the leg cycle will have an impact on the development of individual muscles, but for now we can leave it to speculation. At number 4 we have the rectus femoris muscle. The rectus femoris is a muscle that connects from the hip to the knee and it's one of the four quad muscles but the only one that functions in hip flexion. The other quad muscles include the vastus medialis, lateralis and intermedius, and their role is to help extend the knee joint which is obviously necessary when sprinting, but for this video I didn't rank this on the same level of importance as the hip flexor role played by the rectus femoris. 
For simplicity, I'll refer to the rectus femoris as the middle quad muscle, and when you lift your knee up, you may notice the middle quad muscle being activated. When it comes to weight training, you can build this muscle by front squatting and leg extensions. And also during power cleans, in the portion of the movement where you regather the bar and straighten your legs. At number 3 we have the sartorius muscle. The sartorius muscle is the longest muscle in the body and it connects from the hip bone across the thigh all the way to the inner knee at the upper tibia. The sartorius is another muscle that acts as a hip flexor and because of its positioning it has multiple functions which include abduction at the hip, lateral rotation of the femur as well as flexion at the knee. With its many functions it's known to be a synergistic muscle. In the study that examined the differences in muscle development between non-sprinters, sub-elite sprinters and elite sprinters, the sartorius was one of the three muscles that becomes larger in terms of total volume as you progress from non-sprinter to sub-elite to elite sprinter. To strengthen the sartorius muscle, you need to train the combined movements of hip flexion, abduction and external rotation. You can recruit the sartorius through various conventional leg exercises, but in order to specifically target it, an exercise like the one shown on screen may be most effective. At number 2 we have the tensor fasci latte, often referred to as the TFL. The TFL muscle is the third consecutive hip flexor muscle on this list, and it's the outermost hip flexor muscle on the body, located by the side of the pelvis. It connects to a long tendon known as the IT band that runs down the thigh to the outer knee. The TFL muscle has an additional function to hip flexion in single leg stability. When standing on one leg, the TFL is active to keep you from falling over. It's for this reason that the TFL muscle is typically very strong and well developed in sprinters since you touch down with one leg at a time in the act of sprinting. The TFL is another one of the three muscles that is found to have the most significant difference in volume between non-sprinters, sub-elite and elite sprinters. Before revealing the muscle at number one, a lot of gym bros are probably wondering about the chest and arms since they can't both make it onto this list now but I chose not to include them in this list because I haven't found any conclusive evidence to indicate they give a sprinting advantage. If you watched sprinting in the 90s, you might be forgiven for thinking that chest and arms would both be in the top 10 in terms of importance, and the 5 fastest 100m sprinters in history did all have good arm development, but I'm willing to say that this level of arm development came as a byproduct of good genetics and indirect weight training, and in some cases additional supplementation. The fact that Usain Bolt developed large arms having had naturally skinny arms at 18, but his chest never developed much beyond what a novice gym goer could achieve, leads me to believe that he paid no attention to developing either muscles, but he was genetically predisposed to growing his arms through indirect training, while not having the genes to grow his chest from indirect training. In contrast, an athlete who has said they trained their biceps in isolation with barbell curls is Trayvon Brumel, and despite this training, his biceps and arms never reached that full muscle belly look that we've seen with Bolt, showing how much genetics play a factor. When it comes to the pec muscles, the notion of needing to bench specific numbers to be fast on the track seems to have been phased out, but there are a number of low body mass sprinters who have decently developed chest, and it makes sense that you wouldn't neglect training one specific body part for concern over the risk of causing muscle imbalances. At number 1 on our list of the most important muscles for sprinting, we have the gluteus maximus. Since we've narrowed the muscle groups down to the most significantly active muscle for the top 5 places, I'll name the gluteus maximus as the most important single muscle in the body for sprinting, even though the gluteus medius also plays an important role, but to a lesser extent. The glutes are the largest muscle in the body that are responsible for hip extension, and in the study I've referenced throughout this video, glute volume was found to be the biggest variant between elite sprinters and sub-elite sprinters and accounted for up to 44% of the difference in sprint times between both groups. Some exercises that can help to develop the glute muscles include squats, hip thrusts and Romanian deadlifts, but it should be said that it's not just going to be the muscle development that helps you run fast, but how you apply the force that your muscles are able to produce which is the key skill when it comes to sprinting. Before we end this video, I'd just like to note that this list isn't designed to tell you the order of priority regarding which muscles to train, but rather to shed a light on what specific muscles are activated heavily when sprinting, and what muscles tend to be most developed by elite level sprinters through the act of sprinting itself. 
Each individual athlete will have different body parts that require strengthening and these body parts deserve their own videos when it comes to what exercises to do in order to target specific muscle groups to improve your speed. So please leave a comment and be sure to subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this.